This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Wait, Pope Gregory the Ninth did what? Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. Now, history is truly fascinating and on this video I've put together a list of historical things that when I read them, they literally blew my mind, so I thought you might find them interesting too. Although the majority of facts we'll be focusing on will be historical, in order to give this video a sort of structural logical continuity, the first point is going to be prehistorical. Hold on to your hats. How long did the Stone Age last? Generally speaking, whenever we think of a historical timeline, whether it be the duration of an age, an era, these numbers that we come across can be quite mind-blowing. For instance, the Middle Ages lasted for roughly a thousand years. That's one thousand years. Never mind the one year you need to wait until your next version of iPhone. So as I was going down this rabbit hole, I started asking myself, okay, but how long did the Iron Age last? And how long did the Bronze Age last? Now, of course, these amounts, the duration, and even the specific dates will vary depending on what culture, country, civilization we are talking about, which section of the world. But in general, when we look at, for example, European history, then the Bronze Age lasted about a little over 2000 years. So that's like twice as long as the Middle Ages. Okay, so as we keep going back, then eventually we'll get to the Stone Age, which, as you know, was divided into Paleolithic, Mesolithic and Neolithic. So is it kind of a similar thing? You know, the Middle Ages were a thousand years, the Bronze Age was two thousand years. So is it what, four thousand years for the Stone Age? Uh, what, eight thousand years? Ten thousand years, come on, not even close. When it comes to the timeline of prehistory, the first thing I'd like to say is that the Paleolithic, so the old Stone Age, is the longest of all. In fact, there is absolutely not even a fragment of a possibility of comparison in length between the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, and the Paleolithic. So, cut to the chase. How long did the Stone Age last? The answer may vary depending on the scholar. The Stone Age lasted between 2.5 and 3.3 million years. Yeah, take a moment to wrap your head around that number. Given, I have to say for good measure that the number will in fact depend on what scholar you ask, in the sense that some scholars will actually say that the Stone Age began 300,000 years ago. Still an incredible number, but What's up with this disparity? Well, that is because the people who defend this extremely long duration and so very early beginning of the Stone Age are those who base this date on the earliest evidence of humans using stone tools. And of course, when we say humans, the date will change depending on whether you're just meaning modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, Homo sapiens, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, etc. Still, considering the fact that the Stone Age is characterized by tools made of stone and the first species that started to use stone and shape stone in order to turn it into a tool are at least that old, then when you look at the earliest possible date and you think of 3.3 million years, it literally makes the Middle Ages sound like the blink of an eye. Mind blowing. And that's just the beginning. The University of Oxford is older than the Aztec Empire. <laughs> say what? Literally, when you say it out loud, it just sounds like, no way, the Aztec Empire. But yeah, it's true. Let me explain. See, the University of Oxford is a very unique historical institution, and it does trace its origins all the way back to the Middle Ages. It can claim about 900 years of continuous existence, which makes it the oldest university in the English-speaking world. The official date of its founding being 1096, although that date is not like 100% set in stone. Age. Now, when it comes to the Aztec Empire, however, and we have a look at the actual date of its founding, it's a lot more modern than you would think. And I think the reason for that misunderstanding or that sort of expectations that the Aztecs are something extremely ancient is mostly because probably we inadvertently compare them or put them on pair with the Maya, who are instead a much, much older empire. So when the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés reached the modern-day Mexico area, so those coasts in 1517, he did find already a pretty strong, developed and well-organized empire. 
the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs, or how they call themselves the Mexica, was a Mesoamerican civilization that flourished and prospered in central Mexico. The core, or the center of their power, their city, Tenochtitlan. I swear I cannot pronounce that city to save my life. But the date of its official foundation, and therefore the foundation of the Aztec Empire itself, is 1345. 1345. Compare it to the date of foundation of the Oxford University, and there you have it. And now I'd like to take a moment to mention the kind sponsor that made this video possible, Skillshare. I really love presenting to you Skillshare number once because it's a very valid platform that can teach you real applicable skills. But not only can you learn skills, once you become a member, it can help you achieve your personal professional goals. Now I want to say that most people who have heard of Skillshare, me included up to a few years ago, generally speaking know about the platform because of their video tutorials on how to edit and filmmaking, their photography, their illustration courses, but did you know that Skillshare also has hundreds of hours of content and hundreds of career-focused classes too. And to give you some tangible examples, you can learn how to launch merchandise on your platform for passive income, which is absolutely something I do. You can learn how to grow your audience through video marketing. You can learn how to start a new business. And if one of your goals in 2023 is to become your own boss, then Skillshare can help you achieve that goal. And I can assure you that is definitely one of my personal goals for 2023, to remain my own boss, possibly all the way up to 2053, and then I'll retire possibly on Mars. One of my personal goals that I've been working on has been to improve my Photoshop skills so that I can do a better job with both my thumbnails, but also to do animations of helmet, armor for my video. And apart from that, I've been following the following courses on filmmaking, photography, and finances. Now let me show you specifically two more classes that I've been enjoying lately. Productivity and time management is a fantastic class and one thing I really liked about these classes is the fact that the skills you learn are 100% applicable. The second class I wanted to share with you today is Diversify Your Income, Earn Passive Income. And for me this one has been a big one because it really helped me figure out how to not work harder but work smarter. If all of this sounds like great value to you then absolutely click the link in the description box. Skillshare is offering one month free to any of my subscribers who so click the link in the description below. But for April only, they are running an even better offer. If you're ready to start learning with Skillshare today, you can get up to 40% off your first year using my link. I'm going to leave both links in the description so you can choose which offer works best for you. And once again, big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring my video. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was never straight. Ah yes, the city of Pisa in Tuscany, Italy. That's what we are talking about. And we all know what this city is famous for, right? And no, I'm not talking about the fact that it's apparently hosting the world's largest Kung Fu Practitioners Assembly or whatever the heck that is. I'm talking about the Leaning Tower, La Torre Pendente di Pisa. Thing is though that I think that most people think, well, the tower was built, it was all nice and beautiful, but then something happened, maybe an earthquake, maybe a problem, an engineering situation, and then the tower started leaning, and so people are like, oh gosh, is that gonna crumble? Run, run for your life! But then somehow it stopped, it settled, and here we are, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. But no. That's not what happened. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a medieval building. The construction began in 1173, and it was supposed to be the final structure of the city's cathedral complex. It was designed to stand 56 meters tall, 185 feet, and it is made of white marble. Now, all of that is impressive, but the problem is that already, once the engineers and constructors had reached a third of its eight stories, having completed it, the building's foundation had already begun their uneven settling. At that time, war broke out between Italian city-states, so the construction was altered for almost a century. It's possible that that pause allowed the tower's foundation to settle and probably prevented its early collapse. Anyways, Giovanni di Simone, who was the engineer in charge, resumed construction, tried to compensate the leaning, making the new story slightly taller on the short side, but that sort of extra masonry caused the structure to sink still further. Will it crumble? Probably not for the next 200 years. After that, who knows? A steadily system of tunnels, wells, in order to drain the water underneath. 20 litres of soil were added. All sorts of efforts have been made to avoid the base from sinking further. Great, 
So next time you go to Pisa to practice your Kung Fu, you'll know a thing or two about the tower. The shortest war in history lasted 38 minutes. How does that even count? How is that not like a misunderstanding? I've had arguments with my cousin that lasted longer than that. Alright, so we're talking about a military conflict fought between the United Kingdom and the Sultanate of Zanzibar on the 27th of August, 1896. Wait, the University of Oxford was founded in 1096? This was fought in 1896? Allegedly, the conflict lasted between 38 minutes and a whopping 45 minutes, making it the world's shortest military conflict in history. Literally, I think it took me longer to take down one of the bosses in Conan Exile the other day. I wish human beings learned to use their words, right? The Krakatoa volcanic eruption in 1833. So Krakatoa is a small volcanic island in Indonesia located about 100 miles west of Jakarta. In August 1833 there was a massive eruption or volcanic explosion in the island of Krakatoa which unfortunately killed over 36 thousand people. Now of course such kind of natural disasters are not unique to Indonesia but there is a reason why I made this list and the background of the thumbnail. Not only it was one of the most devastating volcanic eruptions in human history but there is more. The Krakatoa eruptions measured a 6 on the volcanic explosivity index with a force of 200 megatons of TNT. By comparison the bomb that destroyed the Japanese city of Hiroshima in 1945 had a force of 20 kilotons so nearly 10 thousand times less power. The Krakatoa eruption sent six cubic miles of rock, ash, dust and debris into the atmosphere, darkening the skies and producing vividly coloured sunsets and other spectacular effects around the world. We even have a description of the phenomenon written by the English poet Hopkins, who tells us that the skies changed from green to blue, gold and purple, and said that they were more like inflamed flesh than the lucid reds of ordinary sunsets. The glow is intense, that is what strikes everyone, it has prolonged the daylight and optically changed the season. It bathes the whole sky, it is mistaken for the reflection of a great fire. Data seems to suggest that the effects of the explosion even caused a lowering of the temperature worldwide for a few years. But there are other climatic changes that happened as a result of the eruption that were witnessed thousands of miles away from Indonesia. For instance, the amount of rainfall in Los Angeles. And the sound of the explosion was so loud it ruptures the eardrums of people 40 miles away and travel around the world four times and could be clearly heard up to 3,000 miles away. For comparison, that's standing in New York and hearing a sound from San Francisco. Alexander the Great named how many cities after himself? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, everything is okay, thank you. Where are you from? Ah, oh, Alexandria. Oh, really? Alexandria of Egypt? Oh, no, no. Oh, sorry, Alexandria near Antioch? No, no, no. Alexandria near Alexandropolis Medica. Oh, you're from Alexandria Rea, yeah, the one on top of Alexandria Arcosia, but underneath Alexandria, right? I'm so sorry. Of course you're from Alexandria, the one underneath Alexandria Bucephala. Alexandria, South Dakota, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alexandria, Louisiana, Alabama, Alexandria, Ohio, Alexandria, New South Wales in Australia. 2,000 years later. Okay, so Alexander the Great, probably one of the most famous leaders, generals, kings. Everyone describes Alexander as a great warrior with unparalleled achievements, spreading the Greek culture, transversing the ancient world. Alexander the Great was born in Impella, the capital of Macedon, on the sixth day of the ancient Greek month of Hecatombaion, also known as the 20th of July, 356 BC, and he descended from a powerful and illustrious royal family, his father being Philip the second. Alexander definitely owed a lot to his father, who was assassinated, but it is what it is, and definitely, you know, he got power, he got riches, he got the amazing Macedonian army, and he must have been very happy with his name, because not only Alexander founded an enormous number of cities, we'll get to that in a second, but he named most of them Alexandria. I can already imagine the sort of discussion he had with the engineers, settlers and architects every time he was building a new city. Me lord, what shall we name this new city? Alexandria. Me lord, I said 
Alle. Now Alexander had a dream and he wanted to build an enormous empire and one of the reasons why he was building so many cities was not only to expand said empire but also to foster economical, political and social development. Seriously, he was a great strategist, perhaps even a genius, but if there was one thing he was lacking, freaking imagination man. Pope Gregory IX exterminated cats and possibly caused the spread of the Black Death. Okay, this one isn't really true. Whenever you read about Pope Gregory IX, so Gregorius, who was the head of the Catholic Church and ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his death in 1241, you just will come across this idea that he had a lot of cats exterminated in Europe and possibly because of that, you know, Black Death, Black Death was wrought by rats, so there were no cats. This isn't really true, but where does it come from? In 1230, the Pope issued a papal bull called Vox in Rama. Now, the story goes that this bull declared cacks as instruments of Satan and therefore medieval people went ballistic and started murdering as many cats as possible. Although it is true that in the bull the Pope does mention a cat as an instrument of some satanic rituals, the bull does not, however, dictate that Catholics across Europe need to kill cats to stop Satan. The purpose of the bull was to condemn a cult. Did some people perhaps take it to literal and started going nuts on cats? It's possible, but that wouldn't have happened in the entirety of Europe. Also, when it comes to the connection to the Black Death, well, please remember that the Black Death came in 1347. This bull is from 1230. And you don't think that cats are gonna breed back. If you think that, then you don't know cats. All right, noble ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Don't forget to click the link in the description and take advantage of the amazing offer from Skillshare. But thank you very much for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.